and figure things out. But I don't know whether we can interpret madness as madness, or is it that it's our perception of the person? I'm not too sure. Mm. Maybe the person screams and says, yeah, and, and cries out. And uh, if people don't hear them, maybe we call them mad. But they could actually have, be part of uh, our new reality. Wow. Eh? Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelly. <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> The bar uh, is too high. It's it's raised high, yeah. and um, and madness in in whose terms? Because anyone who is unwell sometimes mentally, they think they're fine. No, they know they're fine. They know they're fine. They yeah. know they're fine. It's you, you. It's your perception of them not conforming to your ideas and um, and your ways of thinking. So for him, perhaps he was also crying out like, ah, "Enough." <laughs> so from your interpretation, probably he was okay. Mm. It's, it's the other fellows and the ones who wrote this proverb who are the ones who are yeah, the they were not okay. Yes. yes. After mm. all, who declares madman mad? mad? Yeah. Yeah. It's that, the other ones. <laughs> the, the mad person doesn't declare themselves mad. Yeah. Just mm. consider today we, we really think about Gaddafi as one of our heroes. Mm. Mm. Our lost heroes because he was condemned mm. for what he was actually doing. Mm. But in hindsight, now we know. Mm. Mm. He was howling. Across the continent. Across the continent, yes. Let's get an introduction to your two institutions. Let's start with the Kenya Forestry Research Institute. Uh, Kenya Forestry Research Institute um, is a state institute that deals with forestry research and allied um, natural resources, established in 1986. That is not to say that there was no forestry research being done before. Forestry research has been done since 1934. But before that, uh, we were under agriculture. Then we also, the EAFRO, the East African Curry at one point until we formed our own institution in 1986. And that's where we've been. So the headquarters is based in Mogoga, as you've heard. Mm -hmm. And we have 18 stations countrywide. What do you mean by station? Um, these are regional centers. So the eco-regions in the, in the country. The coastal area, we have the regional coastal area based in, in Gede, and they assisted with um, uh, assistant uh, research, uh, research um, centers in Taitata Veta, Lamo, and also in uh, Bura. Mm -hmm. Then we have the drylands forest uh, re ecoregion, because this country also has the dryland forest. That's basically the headquarters are in, in Kitui. And Kitui also has sub-centers in uh, Kibwezi, um, in Garissa, and a new one that's uh, starting up in, in Wajia. Then we have Muguga, where the headquarters, but we have also the Central Highlands Eco Region, which is also just next door. And for them, they have also an Eco Region uh, sub centers, which is in uh, Nyeri, Rumuruti, and Meru. Then we have in Londiani, that is now the Rift Valley Eco Regional Research Program based in Londiani. And it covers a station in Tarbo, Lodwa, and Marigat. Then we have now um, in, in, West, in uh, West Kenya, and that is at the Lake Region, uh, Eco Region in Maseno. And it also has sub centers in Kakamega, um, uh, Ramogi, and Migori. All right. And what about the coastal forests, the mangroves, and what The mangroves you? are now overseen um, by, the, by the, coast, the coastal program at Gede. Then where I'm based mm. uh, is the National Forest Products Research Program, which is based at Karura. Forest products are found throughout the country, so I don't have a coverage for an eco-region per se. What's mm. a forest product? Forest products. Yeah. We have timber and non-timber forest products. We are okay. talking about timber products and non-timber forest products, which could be fruits, exudants, like gums and resins, fruits, medicinal plants, etc. So the things that you actually now get out of the forests. Things you get out sustainably from the forest. The word sustainably. Yeah, hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> All right. It has to be sustainable. <laughs> we will be talking about that sustainable. Yes. <laughs> yes. So Caroline, you are the co-founder and CEO of Greenport Enterprises. Yes. What's that? Well, Greenport is Kenya's first wholly integrated bamboo business. 
So we took on, nine years ago, we took on a very ambitious, uh, ambitious plan to create a bamboo value chain for our country. And that starts all the way from production of seedlings. Mm. Um, we have large-scale nurseries, both in uh, Nyeri and, and uh, Narok. Mm -hmm. And then we grow the bamboo forests ourselves. We undertake, um, so we also uh, undertake forest restoration. And also uh, now moving on, we'll be producing bamboo products. All the way from, you know, a pen that I have here or paper and um, toothpicks. You know, we keep talking about this whole debate about why is Kenya importing all these uh, toothpicks? And the answer is because we don't have bamboo. And no, the answer <laughs> is that no one has actually commercialized bamboo okay. in our country. We have a lot of bamboo in our country. We've got over 150,000 hectares of existing bamboo forests. And we have also grown about 3,500 acres of bamboo forests over the last nine years. Mm. Now ready to commercialize. Because we believe that unless you create wealth, for the communities, then there's no motivation for you to actually grow a forest. Mm. There's a, you know, there's that whole controversy about, I've got five acres, so what do I use it for? Mm. If it's not making sense for me, if I'm not going to get any income, then there's no point. So actually our motto is, our slogan is creating wealth one tree at a time. So that's what we're trying to do for the bamboo sector. So who do you work with? Interestingly enough... Everybody who has a like 50 by 100 somewhere <laughs> that they bought just to <laughs> brag to their friends, I have a like caprot in there. <clears throat> yeah, we actually do have about a thousand outgrowers mm. in 16 of our counties in Kenya. And uh, we have outgrowers as small as quarter of an acre. And our largest outgrower is a large-scale farmer in Kericho mm -hmm. with 70 acres of bamboo that they've planted with us. So in that program, what we do is that we would then um, give, uh, sell to you the seedlings and then give you an off-take guarantee to buy the bamboo from yourself. You know, this is a question I have to ask. Huh? Mm -hmm. A lot of the push we have, whether it's for forestation or for ensuring that the environment in which we live in is, of course, the word sustainable comes uh, into force. There's always an economic attachment to it. Yes. What about the aesthetic? Uh, can I not just grow bamboo because I like the way it looks? Or it makes me feel happy? Can I not just grow trees because I like because. trees just, just because? It's, perchance it may bear fruits, but I simply like seeing trees and I like bamboo. But that's the, the yes. best way to start. Because... Um, well, bamboo has so many different varieties. There are those of aesthetic value, there are those of economic value. But indeed, nothing stops you from just growing trees for growing trees' sake. And you have seedlings for all these varieties? No, we don't. <coughs> uh, 16, 1,650. We've actually just chosen to specialize in what is of economic value. And then now also moving to those of, you know, uh, ornamental nature. So you see a lot of this... Um, you know, restaurants and everybody else yeah. putting up fencing for bamboo and you know, that's something that we do. This thing called well-being. Yes. Very important. Very. Yes. <laughs> so, so alongside the economic benefits, yes. the things that give someone pleasure are equally important. So that imputation arm of your organization, tell them to consider the aesthetic bamboo. Mm -hmm. yes. Those ones? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very important. So that's like growing a car couple of roses in your backyard yeah. <laughs> and somebody yes. doing commercial farming of rose flowers. Yes, sure. Okay. Mm. So here we are. I'm, I'm just hearing from both of you that there's a case then to be made for um, cutting trees down but replenishing the source. Uh, oftentimes it's just like let's grow more trees, grow more trees and just keep putting trees back into the environment. But then we don't often speak about, look, these trees can actually serve a purpose, whether it's for growing wealth for communities, um, whether it's for establishing infrastructure, you know, using the wood then to go ahead and do something. So if we shift the conversation from don't cut down trees or plant more trees, we can say that these two actions, planting trees and cutting down trees, can actually work in congruence, can they not? They sure can, Andrew, uh, because every tree has its, um, its uses. 
So we do have industrial plantations, and that's where we get timber for construction. Um, then we have also conservation areas where we are conserving the water issue that you're talking about, Colgate, mm. because we have to recharge where the water is coming from. Mm. And those trees we have got to have to have conservation. So we have also to have aesthetics because we have to have um, areas where we can sit and cool off. Mm. The parks, those are for aesthetics. So every tree, every species, every plant has a use. So everything, we just now have to know how do we do it. Mm. Uh, and for plantations, of course, they have um, a cycle. You mm. plant, they'll be on the land, you've managed them 25, 30 years, you'll have to remove them and replant. Oh, okay. So how should we? Okay. So how <laughs> you should have to remove we, them? Yeah. yeah. How should we be cutting down trees? How should it actually work? We, we talk about repopulation of animals and you can go fishing or you can go hunting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How should it work with trees? What kind of time span are we talking about? If you've planted trees and a, what, a tree takes how long to grow from, you know, seedling to maturity? It, it depends it on depends the on species. The, yeah. Yes. So some, they can be mature uh, from 10 years, like yeah. the ones where we are getting uh, transmission poles for electric poles, yes. you know. So we're talking about 10 years. Then right. if you want for timber, like cypress and pines, we're talking of cycles of 25 years, 30 years. Yeah. And that's actually a short term, especially from where this species came from. The Nordic countries, the cycles are 60, 70 years. Wow. So is there open, should there be something like open season for tree felling? Because, <laughs> if, yeah, because if, if you water, planted a plantation. Yeah, 25 years, let it. And then after that 25 years, say, okay, now, guys. Harvest season. Harvest, go ahead. While other trees are being planted, how would that work so that you have this cycle whereby it's healthy for the environment mm -hmm. but then it's also beneficial to people for the growing of wealth yes so like um carefree sisters organization kenya for a service where they have the industrial plantations they have cycles they have programs management plans so even when they're removing them so when they're planting them even in a specific forest they are in they're in blocks mm -hmm. such that you're not clearing several hectares at a time so when you plant now, you'll know that next season you're removing this particular uh, block mm -hmm. and another one. So they'll, at one, any one time, um, it's not a completely bare place. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's what, um, even when we are saying um, for private sector to get into plant, planting um, mm -hmm. tree species, mm -hmm. then you also have to have a guidance from KFS. It's always good to have that so that then again, you know, how will you manage it? Yeah. Because even once you've planted, you know, when you plant them, you also have to remove. Some may not grow well. Some you're thinning and removing the, you're pruning them. So there'll be management cycles. So you need to work so that if you're planting trees for timber, so that you get a good crop at the end of the cycle. So you have to walk the journey with an expert. Mm. It helps. Mm. Yeah. And then if I may add, um, we have to start with the end in mind. Mm. One percentage growth in the population leads to about 14% increase in the need for wood. So we have a huge deficit. So if we start by planning and mm. saying, look, um, this is a requirement for Kenya, for Africa mm. in the next 100 years. So then you can then begin to uh, have a very deliberate strategy to then grow the trees that you need, first of all, not just any trees, mm. but then also manage it and say, look, for every tree that you cut today as an institution, then you're going to plant five more. And that becomes, you know, legislated or whatever it is, mm. so that then we enforce it. Mm. And that way, then you're always increasing that. Mm. But closer to my heart, which is bamboo, once you've planted the bamboo, it matures in six to seven years. Mm. After that, you're harvesting about 25% of that clump every year so it's like a cycle it's like the way you harvest bananas you know you just harvest what is mature right and every year so it becomes a cycle and that one is it becomes almost um an enduring crop it's that's why it's a cash crop mm. so you're maintaining your tree cover and at the same time getting a commercial benefit from so harvesting, harvesting of bamboo, bamboo is actually not clearing the plantation not at all no. It's, it's actually it's like harvesting management. avocado. It's actually sustainable management of just picking the, the fruit. It's not yes. like maize. It's not like maize mm -hmm. that you have to cut the stalk. And no, or sugar remove cane. Or sugar, or sugar cane. cane. No, sugar cane is called a ratoon. You mm. plant and that can yeah. be harvested the two or three times more mm. before you actually have to uproot it. Right. Yeah. Yes. 
So do we have such a plan then, Caroline? Well, we're talking about, all right, our population, yes, we have our projections of our population. We grow by about a million people every year. So let's look at 2060. And this is the need that we'll have for timber then. So in 30 years, if we planted trees now, they'll be able to serve that population then. Do we have such a plan? As far as you, you have been in this sector and you've studied? Now that I've been in the sector close to 10 years, we have had to engage with government. Our first stop was actually at Kefri because we wanted to understand what is it, what is a plan. Kenya has been doing research on bamboo for the last 40 years. So you can imagine the, um, the wealth of knowledge that we have on this area. The second thing that we also have done is to then really initiate a bamboo policy. And I believe in other sectors, as, I mean, other at forest and non-forest products, um, we've also had such strategies. Mm -hmm. So there is a very deliberate uh, strategy to make sure that then we have a sustainable way of maintaining our forest or growing our forest cover and all that. So I think it's, um, yes, the plan is there, but from a private sector perspective as a business, yes, we must have one. Otherwise, then we would not have um, a company that is going to outlive us, and that's our intention. And then there's such a national plan. Definitely. There is a um, last government, we had the 10% tree, uh, tree strategy. Right now, we are on the 30% tree cover strategy uh, by 2032, mm. where we are meant to raise <coughs> actually in the next 10 years 15 billion seedlings. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, and that came about in, in trying to see if we are at 12% tree cover, to raise to 30%, how do we go back and what number of trees do we need? Mm. So we came with that magic <coughs> uh, Is figure. Kenya right now maintaining 12% tree cover? We know that United Nations says between 7 and 10% mm. is what the minimal requirement is. Mm. Kenya right now is maintaining 12%? Yes, now tree cover, because there's forest cover. Mm. Forest cover tree is cover where is you, yeah. yes, so there's a, there's a difference. Okay. So the forest cover is when you have a continuous, um, you know, forest of about a hectare, you know, you've also talked about also the height of the tree and that kind of thing. The tree cover, we are even talking about how much trees even on, even like now the lands are getting smaller. Mm -hmm. Even boundary areas, mm -hmm. you can count those as trees. You're planting them. Mm -hmm. So the tree cover, they'll map that. You know, even as now we are, we are doing that particular um, initiative, we've got to see how we will build it. Mm -hmm. Seedling by seedling. And then and ensuring, not just planting but ensuring that tree grows yeah because that has mm. been our challenge for many years yeah it's growing the trees it's growing the trees okay let's take a break when you come back you'll tell us about sustainably maintaining that tree cover and growing it mm -hmm. so if you are at 12 percent and we are looking at getting to 30 percent mm. in 10 years uh, can we then be cutting Yes. Can we continue taking this product out if we are still, you know, how shall we do this, and how, whether this strategy has covered all that? Let's talk about that shortly. It's 28 minutes to 8. Kenya's biggest conversation is hosting Nelly Odwar. She is the program director at the National Forest Products Research Program at Kenya Forestry Research Institute. Caroline Karioki is a co-founder and CEO of Greenport Enterprises Limited. These are the bamboo people. From here, you'll be telling us about bamboo through and through. Uh, in a couple of years' time, Caroline tells us we'll be doing our own toothpicks. Plus more. For, for all you know, we're probably doing our own toothpicks. Mm. Oh, we are, eh? Mm. Okay. I'm looking at some byproducts of bamboo right next to me mm. on the table here. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, Paper, more, pen, these are more sophisticated than toothpicks. Toothpick is just some things. Yeah. All right. Simple, fundamental. We'll be back shortly. Mm. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Brought to you by Colgate. Once upon a time, two out of three Kenyan parents felt that they don't spend enough quality time with their kids. 
You can help change this by giving a generous voice to story time. Visit our library of homegrown audio stories at cadbury.africa and make story time sweeter. Cadbury, there's a glass and a half in everyone. Property buying tips brought to you by Safaricom Investment Cooperative. One, understand what you can afford. Two, find an agent that fits your personality. Three, factor in all costs. Four, save for a down payment. Five, understand your loan options. Prices ranging from 3.2 million for studio apartment to a favorable 6.5 million for a two bedroom, the Miran residence is the perfect investment suited for you. To book your unit, call 0729 121212. Safaricom Investment Cooperative, the investment partner of choice. KTN Home welcomes you to the ultimate entertainment extravaganza. We've got the hottest shows and the biggest stars. Get ready for a television experience like no other. The perfect balance of excitement, suspense, and pure entertainment. <laughs> Only on KTN Home. Welcome home. It's about glam, swagger, the showbiz. Let's talk local and international highlights. Lifestyle exclusive interviews. My name is Joyce Musoke. Susan Ketani. Mina Karyokin Chikuna. Vera Sindika. Movies and gossip. It may not concern us, but we make it our business. Eco, your premium quality entertainment show. Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Brought to you by Colgate. So you've talked about other things, rare scene, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but then there's trees, which is a big topic right now. Yeah. There was a moratorium and a sort of a ban on logging mm -hmm. out of an outcry by people in the country. And they said, look, our forest cover is basically just being depleted and there's logging that's taking place that's uncontrolled. Now we are back to a position where we are saying, let's allow logging. Kenya Forest Service has come and said, there's a way that this is going to be done. But how should we sustainably harvest from our forests? Uh, thank you, Eric. Yes, the logging ban in 2018, I think, was to just take a breather and just find out what is the situation with our forests. Mm. At that time, we had a new minister, and I think we just needed to understand what's going on in the landscape, and especially we had been trying to reach to the 10% tree cover. And the industrial plantations that are managed by the Kenya Forest Service is just um, about 130,000 hectares. And those are actually the where we had to stop the logging, first mm. of all, so that they could look at that. Um, and, and then also in the community forests as well, right now that are uh, under the management of the counties. Mm. That also had to stop um, so that they could actually just see what needs to be done and what is the status of their forests um, and what help can they get. So right now, even with the lifting of the, of the ban, we are actually looking at those industrial plantations. Because like I had mentioned, when they are planted, they go for a certain period. So right now, those 5,000 hectares 
are ready, over mature actually, mm. to be removed. And then now a system of now planting more. And at that time, um, we, we are made aware that people already had even uh, uh, had paid for some of the, the plantations. So that is what now is happening. Those ones who had already paid and they hadn't extracted the material, that is what is happening. And I think now KFS has been able to now get into the tendering and, and the process. That they so lifting of this ban is basically targeting those ones. Yes. Like saying there's an industrial plantation in some, there's some I've seen in Molo, there's one Molo. where the president was on Sunday. Exactly. There's one area that has been planted and there are signs showing team sales has planted mm -hmm. these trees for, yes. and they've been there for years. Now those trees are big, mature. Exactly. Yeah. So is it such kind of plantations that have been earmarked, identified, earmarked, and these ones where we know they were due to be harvested in 2021. We're in 2023, so it's okay, we can harvest. Yes. Or is it saying, okay, we're now near power, so enter. <laughs> enter. Because that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, because that's the, the impression that we got, mm -hmm. that, uh, okay, locking season, there it is. You have a power saw or an axe, whatever you have, you're welcome into the forest. It, it, it seems as though that was what... It, it was, but yeah. we're saying that it's controlled it's logging. It's a controlled logging. It's okay. controlled logging because you can't just enter the industrial plantations mm -hmm. without the KFS knowing. Mm -hmm. And already you have bid, you've already known how much you need to remove, um, the age of this particular species, and you get the permit to remove it. So uh, it's that process that mm -hmm. is now ongoing. Community? The community now get involved because now we need to reestablish. Once that is removed, the land now becomes bare. Now we need to re-establish uh, more, uh, more plantations. So where the community comes in mm. is that they help in assisting in establishing. There's a Pelis program, the Plantation Establishment and Livelihood System, whereby we, you know now... It's the um, English name for Shamba system. Yeah, the Shamba system. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. What, what is it again? Pelis. Pelis. P e p e l i s. Who is Pelis? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Shamba system. Right. Where now yeah. you use the community to now raise yeah. your new generation of of plantations. Yeah. So, as they are raising the, the the trees, they are also planting their food crops. And what that helps is that they are weeding. Yeah. Because as, until the tree seedling reaches a certain height, where it can now survive without too much competition from the grass and every other weeds, then now the community moves out. Yeah, so that is where the community comes in and benefits. Okay. And also with trees, you know, there'll be also kuni, you know, so that's also something else that also comes out. Uh, and KFS is also able to, to sell that To channel as well. that. Yes. That is okay when you mm. talk about the industrial... Uh, forests that mm. are managed by mm. KFS. So it's clear. I mean, these trees, all of them, same age, so we can cut and they go. Mm. Community forests, where now it's all haphazard. Some of them could be indigenous trees that are there that will be saying, Inti Kata. How do we manage that? Part of the complaints, I'm sure you'll uh, bear witness here, is. In, by 2018, by the time this moratorium, by this ban was being imposed, mm. people were just going into a forest, a community forest, and just cut, mm -hmm. uh, cutting trees because the tree looks old enough and mature enough, cut it. Yes. So now, you know, a number of forestry um, functions were devolved when we, we, we programmated and went into counties. And um, so from the national policy, the county governments were also two to customize into their own, you know, county policies on how they could be able to manage the forests that they have. There are some with uh, indigenous forests, there are some with community woodlands, and that those are some of the things that we need also to, to see how to help them. Because we are 90% semi-arid. Yeah. This is something to worry about. What percentage again? 90%, 90 semi-arid. Have we always been 90% semi-arid? We used to be 70 When we were... Growing up, it was about 75%. Uh, when he was growing up, it was that. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, with many factors, yeah. you know, that has come in with the climate change and uh, desertification, mm -hmm. not ensuring that trees that could sprout back, not ensuring that they can grow back, you know, not managing those woodlands, that is what's causing us to get into 90%. It's really frightening. What exactly are woodlands? 
um the drier areas you know the savanna the savanna mm -hmm. you know we, we get from the savanna the woodlands the grasslands mm -hmm. so there are also brushlands or bushlands so the woodlands you'll get now are trees which will not grow as tall as maybe um the cypress and the eucalyptus right. but yes but you you have now the acacia trees yeah. that's where you'll find them uh -huh. and other species which grow in those ecosystems in this discussion, there's always mm. this matter of greenhouse effect, climate change, and carbon dioxide is right in the middle of this discussion and what trees do mm. to absorb it and what they do in transferring into their system and onto the soil. Now, are there trees that are better at doing this job than others? And when you talk about research and the planting of trees, how do you systematically ensure that you meet all the needs that trees are supposed to meet? Mm -hmm. This carbon dioxide absorbing, absorption, mm -hmm. ensuring that we have adequate forest cover for purposes mm -hmm. of rain and other associated matters, the aesthetic matters, exactly. the commercial matters. How does research yes, play into this and, and, and balance all this? Very good question, CT. So, in all these ecoregions, remember I was telling you that we have carefree ecoregions. Mm. The tree species are also very different in the different areas. So, we have a tree site matching mm. mapping. Mm. So, you've got to know. So, now that we are planting trees, you have got to know which species is suited for that area. Mm. And um, even when we had the cypresses and the pines coming in, they had tried them in the different what areas. What determines suitability? The ecoregion, the, the rainfall, the soil type. Um, yeah, and the temperatures, uh, definitely. But with research... And the altitude. Yes, but with research, can you not commingle these things so that you actually come up with a variety that is resistant to these harsh climates and that can grow anywhere, the, 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 this sort of thing? Uh, I don't know about growing anywhere. What we do <laughs> uh, is breeding. Now we're getting into uh, tree yeah, breeding. That, exactly. That, yes. So you're tree breeding either against, uh, you know, so that they're disease resistant or you're getting a straight tree, less branches, or you want more branches so that it has very many <laughs> seeds. Yes, so that is going on in Kefri. It is. Huh? It goes on in Kefri. Mm. So like now there's a species, a very, uh, it's a hardwood species, fast growing in, in the drylands called Melia Vokete, the Mokao. Mm. Mokao. Mokao mm. is mainly in Makamba mm. and mainly in, the, <laughs> in Eastern <laughs> Kenya. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful tree, fast growing. Um, in 15 years, you, ca you can get actually a mature tree that you can and harvest and, and sow beautiful timber that is the color of mahogany. So that is one species that we've worked on for very many years. First of all, when we got the seed, it was very difficult even to propagate. We got into that issue and, and we are now propagating. Propagate is to, the, to the, the human uh, <laughs> equivalent of impreg <laughs> impregnating. Okay. <laughs> okay. Germinating. <laughs> <laughs> What? Thank you, CT. Trying at least to make sure that <laughs> everyone is conception. understanding the, the terminologies <laughs> I'm using. Exactly. Just to to get the seed and then to grow it. Yeah. Germinating. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from that, and then now, because we could see its potential, mm. so we had scientists going to look at plus trees. A plus tree, is, you see a tree that is looking very nice, we want to get that seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you know <clears throat> that is the one you want to propagate and then now maybe try and breed it. You know, then there's one which is having very many branches. Maybe like for the acacias because of firewood mm. and whatever. That is again something else you're looking at. The traits, the traits you're trying to get. So you breed it for those traits. So for the melia, I know we've pushed it also to very drier places to just see. And they could be just slight differences, of course, Anything that you feed well will grow well, just like a human being. So when you take it to a bit drier, it will survive, yes, much slower, but you'll still get tree cover in those areas. Yeah. The thing that I, 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 I want to ask, even as I can see you've segregated uh, the various divisions that you have to meet the needs and the suitability of conditions to have these plantations. Mm. But... There are people who live here. What efforts does do does the uh, does Kemfri? Kemfri. 
Oh, Kemfri is the other one. Mm. Kemfri. Yes. How do you go about engaging these communities to understand these wonderful benefits that you, mm. as research scientists, know all too well? One of our mandates is dissemination of that information. Yes. How do we share that information? And with who? So you've got to make it palatable. So the, san the science part of it is for the researchers. We'll share it in journals. Then we get into... Oh, pause. Mm -hmm. That's probably where we ought to rethink. Assuming that the science can only be understood by scientists may not be entirely true. But anyway, go on. <laughs> Now, then, we yes. break that in yes. a way that people can now understand it. Now, we could have, um, uh, what do you call them, um, leaflets, mm. radio shows the way we are having now, the agricultural shows. Mm. We have also <coughs> field days. All these centers I'd mentioned, we all have to have several field days, almost every year, six yeah. in the eco-regions, the different eco-regions. Mm -hmm. um, the vernacular radio stations have come those are really pushing it quite a lot with the mm -hmm. tree planting and, and the information that we are sharing. Mm -hmm. Whether it's also diseases, mm -hmm. because we're also telling them, also monitor, because sometimes you can plant trees and you start seeing things are drying up and you can't understand what's happening. So there are ways now we are able to, to get that information, to let them know, please share, when you see this information, this is what you need to do. Let us know, we send a team, and they're able to address those issues. Mm -hmm. But sharing that information, whether it's in guidelines, whether it's in uh, that researchable material that we're talking about, but making it in understandable terms, you know, mm. um, in the way we can be able to do, do, do it. Do you have champions? Do you have, say, uh, specific people who uh, not just propagate what you're saying, but actually put it to practice so that the locals can actually see that what is being spoken of can be envisioned and, and can actually be participated in by them in, in a local area. Yes, because now what we now do is that we, we have demonstration of, um, of these particular species at demo farms, at farms with farmers. So sometimes we have agreements with farmers. This is what we, we want you to, to do. We will manage for you. And it's also a showcasing for other farmers to come and see. So we have, like Mokao, there's a, a specific farmer in, uh, in Kibwezi who has been our champion, been recognized even by the head of state for what he has done. He delved into it in his 60s, and right now he's known in the region. And many people have been going there to see what he's doing, and they're able to replicate. In other regions, it's also happening with the different species. For bamboo as well, we do have that. As, mm. See, I come from a region that's not very far from Kericho. Mm -hmm. So we share a similar ecosystem. Do you have champions? for bamboo growing? Yes, we do. Mm. Over and above what we are doing ourselves, we've mm. got all the farmers who we've recruited. Mm. And um, you find that the champion farmers also, you know, are very proud to showcase the bamboo that they are, they are growing. How do I apply mm. to be recruited? It's very easy. Just uh, tell <coughs> me, like now. Just talk to Carol. Talk yeah. to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's so easy. <coughs> That's it. And so then we'll come and visit you and, you know, just make sure so that you're thing that you the stopped right doing sugarcane. Yes. yes. And you have now this land. I do. Mm. And it's near Kericho. It's very near. And there's somebody with a 70-acre proof of concept mm. in your neighborhood. Mm. Yes. Talk to Carol. I'm going to talk to Carol. Yeah. <laughs> and then now you can do? become the, the community champion. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, Carol, you said that you, when you're working with the communities, you, you guarantee end-to-end -end support. For example, provision of seedlings. I'm sure you also have the extension services in helping to grow these trees and the offtake, right? So, what are those minimum guarantees? You know, now we are in the era of minim guaranteed minimum returns. Yes. Okay. So, uh -huh. <laughs> um, when we start with a farmer, we just also go through what is your expected return. So, we are expecting a farmer to earn about two hundred thousand shillings or so every year when, once the bamboo plantations mature. And that's um, a proposition that is based on how many trees are you planting, what is the expected uh, harvest annually. And on that basis, then we tell you, like, if you do have, say, about 20 tons and we are buying each of them for five to 7,000 shillings, which is a market price right now per ton, uh, 
then after that, then you will expect to get your 200,000 shillings every year. And as the plantation matures, it becomes bigger and your harvest also grows to about, say, 30 tons. So that way then, you, you know, you can see the progression. So that's how we are working on it. How many acres of bamboo do I need to produce a ton? Uh, one acre will produce 20 to 30 tons. Okay. So annually. So mm. that's quite, quite something. Mm. Back to the logging ban. Yes. <laughs> Were you affected by the logging ban? We were very affected by the logging ban. Way back in 2016, just after we started uh, planting the bamboo, one of the things that was very clear to us, for, for the bamboo to be uptaken by many of the farmers to choose to plant in their own plantations, was the fact that they needed to see a factory. Where will I sell this bamboo? Every farmer is concerned about the market. Don't come and bring us a product that doesn't have a market. Yeah. So we actually went to KFS and requested, can you give us 5,000 hectares? of existing bamboo forest so that we can set up a plantation, I mean, sorry, a, a, factory. a factory to produce the bamboo products. Mm. And we went through the whole process. And you know, sometimes it's good to be ignorant. You, do, you just walk in with confidence and you just say, this is what I want and this is why I want it. Right. And this is how we're going to take care of the forest to ensure that we are managing it sustainably. So KFS was very agreeable at the time. And they told us, you know, we will give you this, this land and these are the conditions. And we went ahead and met the conditions. Unfortunately, when the logging ban came, everybody grew cold feet. And they said, you can't touch the forest. They're going to go and you know, harvest from the, the rainforest area. Yeah. So for us, it was a huge blow to mm -hmm. the, the, the actual growth of the bamboo sector in this country. Because if we had started that factory way back in 2017, today we wouldn't even be talking about people, are you going to grow bamboo or not? We'd have seen huge, huge growth because the farmers would have an assurance of the market. Mm. But it set us way back. But, um, you know, so I think this is a very positive um, move that we are going into so, so where okay. people, but we must make sure that, mm. you know, there's, there's due care taken and that also you're betting who is coming into this, in, into this uh, business yeah. to make sure that then uh, we take care of the forest and we're not destroying the, the natural forest, so to speak. Okay, you know, I was going to ask you the follow up question was, don't you think then, because we only have 12% cover and we are targeting 30%, maybe it's not about time to lift the ban. So we can stay. What do we start to lose if we extend this by another five years? I can see, of course, I'll give you, you an example. You will not answer. <laughs> no, I'll give you an example. <laughs> they say that Sweden today has 70% yes. tree cover. Mm. And the reason for that is because they encouraged commercial forestry. Mm. Mm. So what they said, and then they also put in the regulations and said, look, if you cut one tree, you have to plant two trees. So in, in, a, in a period of less than 30 <coughs> years, they mm. managed to, to double their tree cover. Mm. So that's what we need to do. And, and just say, look, if we allow you, because us guys, we're going to do it for 10 years. And then after that, say, look, should we continue? Have we done it correctly? And of course, be policed by the Kenya Forest Service. That's a mandate. And how are we doing it? So we actually went through a lot of sustainable forest management practices in natural forests. That was, that, it happens world over. So it's not something that we are, we, it's not recreating the will. So I would then say that, that if we are going to achieve this, it actually sounds counterintuitive, but that's the correct way to do it. Hmm. By encouraging people and telling them, it's just like avocados. Look at avocados today. Hmm. You don't even have to be encouraged. Everybody's dying to do it. Because you can see the benefit. Yeah, they can see the benefit. So then, Nelly, if we're talking about, you know, trying to get towards 30% tree cover hmm. and saying if you take a tree down, put two back, how long will it take to get from the current 12% to 30 percent with that practice actually the, the the strategy is saying that each year each individual is to plant 30 trees such that in 10 years each kenyan has planted 300 trees and that's why you saw the head of state saying you plant your age because maybe you, you have a child who's one year the people who have been born so there's there's an average i think um my colleagues were able to get that mm. so they've they've sort of averaged that at 30, 30 trees each year per person per year, per, per person per year. Mm. that's what will contribute to the 15 billion trees 
30% tree cover by that time. But you know, there are already some trees already maturing as right. we continue mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. and planting. And the game changer right now is it's now a variety of trees that we are not, not just in industrial timber. We're talking of fruit trees. is now been included. So the avocados are coming in. The purples are coming in. Oranges, oranges are coming mm -hmm. in. You know, we are now even getting involved with schools and colleges where there is enough land. Yeah. And you can even set up a woodlot or a fruit orchard yeah. and, and ensure that those trees are surviving and they grow. And that's the strategy because it's all hands on deck. That's what the government is asking for. It's no longer just a carefree affair or carefest. Everyone, this is your responsibility. If I can just be allowed <clears throat> to quote, in the Bible, we were charged to take care of the environment. This is now our time. Everyone has to take care of it mm. and ensure that you're actually, you know, ensuring that we are planting a tree and ensuring it's growing mm. and taking care of the environment. So even the trees that we're even planting to ensure that we're reducing soil erosion, reduce the soil loss into the rivers. Degraded lands, 5.1 hectares, mm. million hectares. We've got to do that as well under this, uh, this 10-year UN uh, land, of land restoration. Mm. Mm. Those, again, we've got to look for the species that mm. can now reclaim those uh, degraded lands. Yeah. Well, very well said, mm. Carl. Mm. And Nelly, uh, you know, when we said it, when the president was saying what he was saying on Sunday, mm. it was on the back of a lot of work and a lot of information that he had consumed. Mm. Mm. The way he said it, with the short time that he said it, may have been now taken a whole different route. Yeah. But thank you for clarifying. Nelly Oduor is the, the pr Program Director at National Forest Products Research Program at Kefri and Caroline Karaoke is the Bamboo Lady. She is the Co-Founder and CEO of Greenport Enterprises Limited. Keep it here for more conversations. It's 8 a.m.